All right, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to start by saying that it's, it's wonderful that we have so many uh, people participating from all over the world. I think it's fantastic that we have participants all the way from uh, Australia to, uh, to Brazil. Uh, and it's a fantastic opportunity for us to see uh, that it's possible to actually have a gathering online like this. And we might even do the next uh, Emerge uh, European gathering online to save us all uh, flying all over. Uh, I was sharing, sharing earlier in our little check-in group that I feel at this moment in time um, a lot of sadness and vulnerability. I have my children scattered all over Europe. They are safe, but they are scattered. And I have my two old parents, both around 90 years old, uh, outside Gothenburg. Uh, and I feel worried uh, about them. And I feel vulnerable. But then at the same time, I also feel an excitement. And I feel an excitement about being alive at this very, very interesting and frightening uh, moment in, in history. Uh, and I will use these 20 minutes to both give a little bit of a framing to where I see where we are in this interesting moment in the history, but also give a few tools that I think that we could that we can use uh, during tomorrow. So I will do this by trying to share my screen. And let's see if that works now. So I want to start at the same point where I started in uh, Kiev in September, when we had our last European Emerge gathering. And I was starting there by showing this picture of the United Nations skyscraper in New York and Greta Thunberg's quote on it. And I will not read it, I will just read the start of it and it's starting by saying we can no longer save the world by playing by the rules and then it ends by saying everything needs to change and it has to start today and this was already in september that's more than uh, half a year ago and long before this Corona crisis. So there is a sense of urgency, and there was a sense of urgency already back then, not the least, of course, because of the climate change that we are seeing. But at the same time, as we have this urgency, we also have to realize that we have to slow down. And this is a quote by my, my friend, the African philosopher, Bayo Akumulafe, who you can see here with his family. And he says that my ancestors tell me, we are in an emergency, we have to slow down. And this is very counterintuitive to us Westerners, but I think this is really, really important right now. It's very easy in a moment like this to be focusing on everything that's happening outside us, all the problems and the crises. And we will be talking about that both tonight and tomorrow. But I think it's very, very important that we also ask the question, where am I in this? And also the question, who 
am I in this? And really take the opportunity to not distract ourselves by all the events and all the emergency and all the urgency that is happening around us. But to resist that distraction and to also look within and ask us these fundamental questions about ourselves. But of course, the crisis is out there as well as inside us. And we've been talking about this meta crisis now for a couple of years. And now on top of all these different crises we see out there in the world at the moment, we have the acute crisis of the coronavirus. And we can ask ourselves, why do we call this a meta crisis? And how is all this connected? And of course, all of this is connected. And that is what we are starting to realize more and more. And the virus is forcing us to realize that we are all interconnected, not just interconnected between us different human beings, but we are also deeply interconnected with nature and with society and with the universe. And I think this picture here, it's an installation by an Argentinian uh, artist, very well uh, illustrates how everything in the world really are systems interconnected with other systems within systems. And of course, the world has always been interconnected like this. But with the technological development, when the world is shrinking, we start to realize this more and more, that everything is connected. The virus crisis is not disconnected from the economical crisis. The economical crisis is not disconnected from our meaning-making crisis. All of this is acutely interconnected. And that's something that we are going to explore during these two days. One thing that is common for both the coronavirus uh, pandemic that we are living through, and also the de technological development that we are living through, is that both these processes are exponential to their, nat to their nature. And we humans do not naturally perceive exponential growth or exponential change. We tend to think in linear terms. And just to illustrate this, the power of exponential growth, whether it's viruses that are growing or if it's technological innovation that is growing, I sometimes talk about the effect of taking 30 steps and comparing what is happening if we are taking 30 steps linearly or if we are taking 30 steps in an exponential way. If we take 30 steps linearly, of course, I end up somewhere at the end of this large room. But if, but if I take 30 steps exponentially, meaning that I double the distance I go for each step, where do I end up after 30 steps? Where do you think? Well, I actually the moon. by the moon after 30 steps exponentially. But that's not the hardest thing to understand. The hardest thing to understand, I think, is that 
where do you think we are after 10 steps? If at 30 steps we are at the moon, where are we after 10 steps? And the answer is that we are still in the block. We haven't left our quarter. So, in, in many times when we have this exponential curve, we, we tend to think that here somewhere something is happening and some sort of very fast exponential growth kicks in. But that is actually not the case. The growth rate has been the same all the way from the start. It's just that we are not perceiving it. And here is exactly now at this point, the knee of the curve. Here is where we are right now, both when it comes to the virus, but also when it comes to the technological development. And that is why we have such difficulties in handling both of these exponential change. We are always taking decisions too late. When, when, we, when we finally start to see the growth, then it's already too late. So how can we relate these two exponential growths, the growth of technology and the growth of virus, and how can we learn to see that we need to try to be always one step ahead and the exponential growth always happens much, much more rapidly than we would intuitively think. This rapid technological change that we have had all through humanity has pushed us into making large shifts in society. And one of the videos uh, that uh, Sana sent out before this uh, gathering was um, uh, by Margaret Whitley. And she's engaged in, a, in a, an institute in the US called the Berkana Institute. And they have this two loop model of how this, these cultural or paradigm shifts happen. And some of you have seen me talk about this before, and it was also in the video from the Emerge gathering, but I think this is so important for these days that I want to rapidly just flip this through. The last time we in humanity had this dramatic shift in society, that, that was during the Enlightenment, when we went from a dogmatic religious worldview into a rational scientific worldview. And of course, back then, the old paradigm was a medieval paradigm that had its peak in the high medieval time. And then a lot of technological change happened. We had the printing press, but not only the printing press, on the other, also other technological developments happened. And we entered into a period of uh, chaos, a period of in-between time, a period of being between worlds. And that was the French Revolution. It was the Napoleonic Wars. Europe was in, in chaos for around 50 years. But it was also the start of the Industrial Revolution. And out of this chaos came a new world, a new paradigm. And that is what we today call modernity. Now I believe that we are at an equally important, at least equally important paradigm or societal shift again. This time, the old paradigm is modernity, which we might say was at its peak in, in Scandinavia, uh, around the 70s or perhaps the beginning of the 80s. And then technological development, the internet, but also other developments happened. 
and I now believe that we are entering in to this in between world period. And something new will be born out of that. But we do not know what that is. And the whole idea behind the Emerge project is really to explore this what is emerging. And as with any self organizing complex system, I don't believe that we can manage or steer this emergence, but I think that we can facilitate it. I also think that we are reaching a phase transition or a bifurcation point, meaning that this transition can go in two different ways. We can either have a breakthrough into a more complex, but also more elegantly arranged society, or we can have a breakdown. So I think it's either a breakthrough or a breakdown. And what will determine whether we will break through or break down, or one of the determining factors, I think, will be our ability as humans to relate in deeper, more complex, and more compassionate ways to each other, but also to ourselves, to society, and to, and to nature. Another way of looking at this is to look at this in, in the language of the World Value Survey. And I know that many of you have been using uh, this tool to look at uh, societies and societal development. Interestingly uh, enough, up here in this corner, we have all the, all the Nordic countries. We have Denmark, Norway and Sweden. So we are quite unique here up in the corner. I will not go into the details here. Those who are interested in, in this can read this, for example, in my book, The World We Create. But I should say that um, during the last, before the last paradigm shift, before enlightenment and the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution, we were all in this corner of the diagram. We were all, or 99% of humanity, operating in a survival mood and with a religious or dogmatic worldview. And then at the last paradigm shift, we broke out of this box and broke into a completely new space opened up, both in terms of an inner development our values and goals going from being only survival driven to more and more people in, in, in the world were able to move also into self-expression. And again, the Scandinavian countries are really at the top of, of, of this, having moved very far in the self-expression space. But also we moved from a religious to a secular worldview to a scientific and a rational way of looking at the world. I think that the, that the transition that we are now in is actually breaking out of this box, breaking out of the greater box like this, into a new space that is opening up for humanity. And what will that be? Nobody knows. We, we can just guess where we are heading. But I certainly think that we in, in the Scandinavian countries might be in the forefront here. And of course, these dots here in, in the diagram, they represent some sort of average point in the culture. So I think in the Nordic countries, and, every, and of course even in other countries to a, to a lesser extent, there are already a lot of individuals who are operating in this new space. And what could this be? So if we're looking at the, the line here of, uh, of the inner development, I think we are moving into from self-expression to perhaps self-transcendence. 
moving from, in Otto Scharmer's terms, from ego consciousness to eco consciousness, a consciousness that goes beyond our own ego. And in the worldview uh, dimension, we are, I believe, moving away from a pure, secular, rationalistic, scientific worldview to a more holistic or integral worldview that are integrating both indigenous ways of looking at the world, pre-modern ways of looking at the world, modern ways, and post-modern ways of looking at the world. But this is, of course, guessing. We don't know. And we are not just spectators in this. What will emerge here is dependent on how all of us both act, but also think, and how we show up. I will just very briefly mention two publications that you might all be interested in that. Uh, is available for download on uh, uh, the Accredit Foundation homepage. One is this vertical dimension of new worldviews and new dimensions, and th they are a bit summarized in this little booklet, which is available in PDF format called Changing the World We Create. And on the horizontal axis, looking at our self-development, we have um, together with the researchers at the Stockholm University, compiled a little booklet called On Becoming of Conscious Co-Creators that describes in very simple language the uh, uh, skills that we need to develop to be able to transform and to move towards the right on this personal development scale. So that's two tools. Here is another tool I want to leave you with. It's um, Bill Sharp's model of three horizons. When we are talking about things that are falling away or things that we are leaving behind or things that are dying, and when we are talking about things that are being born and things that we might need to put in place in order to facilitate this transition or this birth of, of a new civilization, it can sometimes be useful to distinguish between the three horizons, where the first horizon are the things that we can do in the current system, things that we need to do urgently in the current system. The third horizon is the world that we hope might be born the world that we will be living in in 20 or in, in 50 years. But then in between those two worlds, there is a second horizon, which might be things that we need to put in place. Not that we will believe that they will be part of the, the new civilization, but they might be things that we need to put in place to be able to facilitate the transition. And one example of that, in, in my view, might be a universal basic income. I personally do not think that. I think the economic system will have to transform so much in the, um, in, in the basic that we will not at all recognize the economic system we will have in 20 or 50 years. But we might need, in an interim period, to have something like universal basic income to be able to move from the present world into the new world. So again, when we, when we speak about things that we think we need to do or things we need to let go of, let's keep uh, it clear whether we talk about the first, the second, or the third horizon. Thank you, Thomas. Finally. Thomas, final words? Yeah. Nope, I've got two more, two more things to say. Two more things to say, and I know I'm 20 minutes and 12 seconds now. So um, uh, I just want to tie back to um, where, we, where we started and to, and to say, and to quote you, you said that in the introduction, that we do not want to go back to business as usual. 
I hear so many now politicians and uh, industry talking about that we need to put a lot of money into the, um, the market in order to, as soon as possible, go back to business as usual. And of course, we need to do all of these things to alleviate suffering. But I think we need to really think about what, where we want to go. And we don't want to come out of this crisis back to business as, as usual. I don't think we know what the world will look like on the other side of this crisis. But in some important ways, it is actually up to us. We are these imagined selves that, that Margaret Wheatley is talking about. We are the imagined selves. We will have an influence on how this will play out. And even if we might not be able to initiate a total transformation of the system, one thing is for sure, and that is that the world will not be the same. And then finally, who am I in this? This is the moment that we have been preparing for. All of us that have been involved with uh, our personal uh, meditation practice, or we've been doing personal development work, or we've been reading and writing books about societal change. This is the moment we have been preparing for. How will we show up in this, at this moment? Who will I be in this? And I will leave you with five questions here for these two days. And the first question is, who am I becoming? Who are we becoming? What are the images that dominate my reflection and rumination right now? How do we know who we are when our world falls apart? What does it mean to be a person living in a time between worlds? And finally, how can I choose to be part of the light? Thank you. Thank you so much, <laughs> yes. Thomas. You're getting a lot of jazz hands here. <laughs> oh, thank you.